I wish I were Alice Munro, and then it <laughs> would really have been worth your while coming out tonight. Uh, but I am going to talk about uh, the work that Alice Munro did at Western and published at Western, and in fact, these are her very earliest uh, publications. In the fall of 1949, Alice Munro, then Alice Laidlaw, entered the University of Western Ontario intending to do a degree in journalism, but more intent on becoming a fiction writer. During her first year at Western, she took courses in history, French, economics, psychology, and English, which was required by the journalist, uh, journalism program. Unfortunately for journalism, it also drew her to the attention of the head of the English department, Murdo McKinnon, who persuaded her to switch from journalism to honors English. Almost certainly another reason for McKinnon's interest in Laidlaw was the short story named The Dimensions of a Shadow that she published in the English department's undergraduate creative writing magazine, Folio, in the spring of 1950. It was her first published short, short story to appear in print. And as John Fremlin would later recall, when the editor of the magazine read it, he ran down the hall, waving it in his hands and shouting, you've got to read this, you've got to read this. The Dimensions of a Shadow was followed by two other short stories in Folio. In December 1950 came Story for Sunday, and in April 1951, The Widower. Perhaps Folio would have hosted other Laidlaw short stories, but at the end of her second year, her scholarship ran out, and now married to James Munro, she left Ontario for British Columbia. Anyone who's thinking of donating money for scholarships, uh, take note of that, please. <laughs> A decade later, in Lives of Girls and Women, Monroe would describe the lives of ordinary people as dull, simple, amazing, and unfathomable, deep caves paved with kitchen linoleum. In the pages of Folio, the exploration of those deep caves was well underway, assisted by writers such as James Joyce and D.H. Lawrence, whom Monroe probably encountered in her English classes, and by the ideas of two thinkers whom she probably studied in her psychology class. Carl Jung and Sigmund Freud. Tonight I'll concentrate on two of the folio short stories, The Dimensions of a Shadow and Story for Sunday, not only because they, are very, clear, they very clearly indicate the influence of Freud and Jung, but also because they are to an extent mirror image, images of one another. The first focuses on a female teacher who is infatuated with a boy in her class and the second on a 15-year-old girl who is infatuated with her male Sunday school teacher, shades of Demi Moore and Celine Dion. <laughs> as she emerges, and I'm turning to the first one now, as she emerges alone from the church at the beginning of the dimensions of a shadow, its main character, Miss Abelhart, is wearing shoes and clothes that she has chosen for their ugliness and absurdity, and that she wears with a certain defiance as if she recognized in them a drabness closely akin to her own. Even her tightly and tastelessly curled straw hair contributes to the effect, as apparently does her makeup. Something like dust lay 
all over her face. In Jungian terms, this is her persona, a kind of mask designed on the one hand to make a definite impression upon others, and on the other hand, to conceal the true nature of the individual, a two-dimensional reality that feigns individuality, making others and oneself believe that one is individual, whereas one is simply acting a role. Apparently, Miss Abelhart's persona is convincing, for people who looked at her knew that she was old and had always been old. In fact, however, she is only 33, the age, that is, of Christ at the time of the crucifixion. And as such, the first of a number of hints in the manner of Joyce in Dubliners and D. H. Lawrence in The Horse Dealer's Daughter and elsewhere, that a Christological pattern is at work in the dimensions of a shadow. If, as her spinsterhood and name, Abelhart, murdered heart, already suggest, Miss Abelhart has developed her persona at the expense of her inner self, then psychological problems will soon manifest themselves. And they do. When she responds to an invitation to join other parishioners in a temperance meeting, her eyes are cunning and afraid. And she repeats the word no and its close relative not seven times, the last three under her breath. Evidence now quickly accumulates to suggest that she is a neurotic in a state of psychic disequilibrium that is manifesting itself in the dissolution or disintegration of her persona, Jung's words, and a consequent release from her unconscious of what Jung variously calls involuntary fantasy and repressed personal fantasies. Often lately, states the narrator, Miss Abelhart found that she was talking to herself, first feeling happy to be free for a moment and then acknowledging that it is, a, it is terrible to be endlessly alone. She continues on her way. It's early June, a time of growth and maturation, and pale, soft clouds are promising rain. But here, unlike in T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, no fertilizing rain and redemptive, uh, fertilizing and redemptive rain will fall. The air is filled with the heavy sweetness of lilacs that, Miss Abelhart, that, like Miss Abelhart, are already past their prime. By a garden gate, some similarly symbolic peonies droop, their deep reds darkened, and their petals fallen together. Outside the town, adds the narrator, there are night flowers, dark and scentless, stars buried in the long grass but those she would never see. As night approaches, she moves ever closer to confrontation with, quoting Jung again, the dark interior world that lies beneath her persona and the penumbra of her consciousness, the dark hinterland of the psyche where crepuscular figures lurk. Walking along the street in the deepening darkness, she shows signs first of infantile regression and then of paranoic delusion. Like a child, she avoids stepping on the cracks in the sidewalk. And like many of the characters in Dubliners, observes the houses on either side of the street, houses of brick and stone, decent with porches and steps and shutters, closed houses watching covertly with hooded eyes, knowing their place in the pattern. Yet some of them had lamps lit in the windows. Then, in the yellow circle under a streetlight, she encounters three girls who greet her with the quick, bland smiles reserved for a teacher. And that's the first indication of her stereotypically repressed profession. That's certainly what's happened to me. And trigger, <laughs> and trigger a self-protective reaffirmation of her persona. Noticing the lovely clarity of the girls' features, and the grace of their young bodies, she looks away from them, straightens her shoulders, and walks more stiffly, more carefully, feeling the girl's clear eyes on her back. What happens next is the sudden, and for the reader, quite unexpected manifestation of the shadow 
of the story's title, which is to say the emergence from just below the surface of her consciousness of a projection and personification of aspects of herself, her ego, that are usually suppressed by parental, religious, and social pressures. She thought of the boy. The thought of him was never far from the surface of her mind, always wavering like a shadow over her consciousness. Girls like that were for him, their long, light limbs and their soft mouths and the tender fullness of their cheeks were only for his pleasure. They smiled at him and followed him with their eyes. They waited for him and wanted him. One of them he would choose. The sexual electricity of this passage leaves little doubt that the part of her nature that Miss Abelhart has repressed is her libido, which Jung maintains can never be apprehended except in fantasy images. Immediately after her heavily eroticized and envious response to the three girls, such a fantasy image emerges from her unconscious, couched in italics in the text to indicate the articulation of a hitherto unexpressed aspect of her psyche. But he does not look at them as he looks at me. They are young and common and willing. In other words, she's going 50 shades of, cr of gray crazy already. Sympathy for Miss Abelhart becomes tinged with repugnance, I think, as it emerges that the boy in question is in her upper year Latin class. Latin being, of course, an appropriately moribund language for her to teach, and as her mental picture of him is placed on view. His dark hair was tumbled, his long legs stretched carelessly across the aisle. Then slowly he lifted his head and smiled, his brown eyes twinkling to hazel, and his mouth twisted up at one corner so that he looked like a roguish, beautiful little boy. His slim body was too frail and graceful, his untidy curls too picturesque, and his smile too charming, but he was beautiful. When she thought of him, Miss Abelhart felt a great tenderness and anguish. Once, Sunday had been for her a day for forgetting about Latin class. But now, it is an empty day, stretching and yearning towards Monday. Letting me down here. When the, days of, when the days of meaning and possibility began again, namely, seeing the boy in class, seeing him in assembly, seeing him in the halls, watching her, and hiding secret things under his words. Fearing for her sanity, she nevertheless crosses the street and stands in front of the school, which holds the early darkness around it becoming shadowy and indistinct. Both psychologically and atmospherically, the conditions are now ripe for the apparition of the shadow side of her personality, a fantasy image of her unrecognized desires, again Jung's word. Everyone has a shadow, writes Jung, in modern psychology and religion. And the less it is embodied in the individual's conscious life, the blacker and denser it is. If it is repressed and isolated from consciousness, it is liable to burst forth in a moment of unawareness. If it comes to a neurosis, we have invariably a considerably intensified shadow. When the fantasy image Julie appears in the form of the boy in her Latin class, and greets her with, hello, Miss Abelhart, she trembles. And when he tells her that the school year about to end has been more important because of her, a deep shiver passes over her whole body, and she is happy and afraid. He was here then. He was looking at her and telling her, and telling her, and he was himself, not the restless, beloved shadow that ate the substance of her mind. As a manifestation of that shadow, the fantasy image also resembles 
and aggregates other such boys whom she has known, the boy at college, the boy at home, and later in the short story, other boys. When the fantasy image states that he has had a crush on her and admits that initially he could not understand why this happened since she is perhaps as, as old as my mother and not pretty, she takes him to mean that she is, in her words, sexless, like a block of wood or a husk of corn, and concedes that to eyes other than his, she appears barren and sterile and useless. The things that had lain so darkly hidden, comments the narrator, were given sound and shape and hung in the air. Miss Abelhart's concern with how she is perceived by other people remains a central focus of the dialogue as the fantasy image continues to wonder why he has a crush on a woman about whom everyone laughs. Maybe it wasn't anything about me, she suggests, before entering a heartfelt plea for affection on behalf of all women. Did you ever think once in your life, a woman, once in her life, a woman has a right to have someone look at her and not see anything but her, just her, herself? Every woman has a right, no matter how old or ugly she is, someone should love her, even because she is ugly. Having voiced this appeal, she invites the fantasy image to walk with her and to tell her about his crush. As they proceed, the town clock strikes nine, the hour of the crucifixion, an illusion that brings with it a sense of imminent suffering. As they pass under a street light, her shadow is black and solid and clearly drawn, but he, his is long and misty, curving like smoke over the sidewalk and the grass. The crush began during the fall, he recalls, when she came to watch a rehearsal of Shakespeare's As You Like It, in which he was playing Orlando. Not fortuitously, of course, because in the play, Orlando falls in love with Rosalind at first sight. Dressed in tights and a homemade suit, green suit, she recalls, young Orlando was tall and gallant and lovely, moving like a wild young animal on a bit of wooden stage and shaking the curls on his forehead. In stark contrast to this image of youthful masculinity and vitality is the accompanying evidence of her age and mortality. The sun had gone down outside and the smell of burning leaves came in through the window. From the time she came to watch the rehearsal, the fantasy image continues, he became obsessed with her, waiting longingly for Latin class, leaving a book in her classroom so that he could return to fetch it, playing the piano in the rec room during midday break for her rather than for the girls with long legs and loud voices who were dancing. I don't know how my crush on you can stop, he wails in exasperation. I don't know what to do. In response to this gratifying outburst, Miss Abelhart feels a rush of tenderness that makes her want to stroke his hair and hold his head gently in her hands, an urge evocative of Mary Magdalene's response to the risen Christ. She does not touch him, however, but stares at him, fascinated, almost unbelieving. It is you, isn't it? She whispers, you are here. Convinced that he loves her as none of the others did, she coaxes an affirmation from him, a yes, yes, love me, yes, yes, I do, that is resonantly Laurentian in wording and fully in accordance with her conviction that every woman has a right to be loved. A woman has to have something, even a husk of a woman like me. I always knew a woman had to have something, and now I have, she says. I never saw anyone's face look like that, for me. With that, she breaks Christ's commandment to Mary Magdalene, noli me tangere, don't touch me, takes his face in her hands, and after he has twisted away from her, whispering, 
don't look at me like that, their interaction ends. I don't care if you forget, she says. I don't care if I don't have anything for the rest of my life. Oh, you don't understand, do you? He did not answer. He did not even turn his head. You are so young, she says gently. Then go home now. I'll go the rest of the way by myself. Go home. It's all right now. Goodbye. Without saying goodbye, the fantasy image turns and moves away. In a moment, she cannot see him at all. His body has faded into thin darkness. Miss Abelhart's personal shadow has manifested itself, but it has not, as Jung urges, been integrated into herself. To adapt Jung's words in psychology and religion, she has not found a way in which her conscious personality and her shadow can live together. Her mere suppression of the shadow with the words, go home, is just as little a remedy as, again in Jung's words, beheading against a headache. Because of this failure, she remains incompletely individuated and in a mental state that is potentially pathological. As she walks towards her boarding house, she is crying and the close, sweet night presses around her, making her weak and sick. The night is full of poisonous vapors and whirling, dissolving shadows, and she is dizzy, very dizzy. It remains to the three girls whom she encounters earlier to shatter her illusions and to precipitate her psychopathological breakdown. She thought she was talking to somebody Jesus Christ, exclaims one horrified girl in a blasphemous fulfillment of the Christian references in the story. She thought there was someone there right beside her. By the way, one of Alice Munro's uh, female relatives strongly objected to the Jesus Christ because it is blasphemous. Uh, but of course, it's important for the short story. For Miss Abelhart, there will be no psychological resurrection only a mental crucifixion and a descent into psychic hell. In the purple passage with which the dimensions of a shadow ends, she staggers once and leans against a lamppost. She presses her hands to her head and stares into the outer darkness. The night is black, the color of madness. The laughter of the girls rises crazily and screams about her ears and then falls away. Miss Abelhart is alone in a bottomless silence. And I think her expression reminds one of Edvard Munch's the, the scream, the shout. Story for Sunday, the second uh, short story that I'm focusing on tonight, also focuses on the sexuality of its female protagonist, but this time from a perspective that is Freudian rather than Jungian. When it opens, the 15-year-old Evelyn, whose age places her at puberty and whose name, Eve Lynn, indicates both her innocence and her susceptibility to temptation, is hurrying towards church where she hopes to be of assistance to the new Sunday school superintendent, Mr. Willens. Despite her father's caustic comment that only kids go to Sunday school, and that it is time for her to grow up, and her mother's condescending description of Willans as a clerk down at the factory, she is determined to go because the glow of a secret trembled inside her. Some of the attitudes and behaviors that Anne Freud, Anna Freud, Freud's daughter, sees as characteristic of puberty in her highly readable and popular The Ego and the Mechanisms of Defense, just two years before um, Monroe came to, uh, to Western, are already evident in the opening sentences of Story for Sunday, and others will soon appear. Defiant rebellion against any and every authority, submission to some self-chosen leader, and religious asceticism. Before the nature of her secret is re revealed, Evelyn is characterized as both religiously susceptible and fanciful. To her, the church is the only building in the village which is not squat or ugly, 
the only real place. The stores and the houses and the shabby rooms at home where she had left her parents do not exist anymore, nor the days of the week. There is only the church and only Sunday. As she, as she opens the door to the church basement, her whole body comes alive in a new way and tingles with faint excitement. Her thoughts are a little dizzied and for a moment it is hard to realize that she is here and not living in a daydream. Once inside the basement, she transforms it in her mind's eye into the body of the church above. The room is very dark after the sunlight. Only two small yellow lights are lit. They burn like candle flames, one on each side of the platform. Evelyn makes the platform an altar. The worn carpets with the dirty fern leaves, the frayed velvet curtains become rich and mysterious, blood crimson in the shadow. Looking around the room, she notes first a text behind the tall pulpit chair that reads, Blessed are the pure in heart. Then paintings with strangely misted landscapes and men and women in loose, vivid robes. And finally, the pure and passionless face of Christ, careless silken locks rounded by white radiance. The few readers who have not already guessed Evelyn's secret are now given a large clue. Today, when she looks at the pictures, it is not quite the same. Even in the depths and stillness of the moment, she remembers <coughs> Mr. Willens. Sometimes during puberty, the individual becomes attached to an older person whom she takes as her leader, writes Anna Freud, in what could be a commentary on what is to come. While they lost, these love relationships are passionate and exclusive, but they are, shor are of short duration. Could be a comment on Taylor Swift's songs as well. <laughs> as other people arrive in the church basement, Evelyn pays particular attention to the flamboyantly named Myrtle Fotheringay, who seats herself at the piano and begins to play over the hymns that will be sung in the service. With her little plumed hat, her dainty fur top boots, I, I've got to believe that's a Freudian symbol in the popular sense, and her small, delicate female hands, Myrtle is so consciously and completely a woman, so vividly feminine, that even looking at her, Evelyn feels uh, herself to be a neutrality, a blob of nothing and everything without shape or color. This sense of non-entity and formlessness quickly gives way, however, to a less abstract and more searching reflection on her physique and appearance that captures brilliantly, I think, the agonizing self-doubts of many girls and boys of 15 years of age. She looks down at her own large hands, her feet big in clumsy galoshes. Her feet, her body is too big in every part, too bony and uncertain of itself. All her movements are too indecisive, constrained. Her hair has not curled right either, and she knows that her cheeks and forehead are heavily flushed with all the freckles showing. She feels dampened and a little weary. She is only a lumpish thing after all, not in the littlest way like the self, self of her imaginings. That Mr. Willens would ever notice the plain and gangling girl that she now recognizes in herself strikes Evelyn as unbelievable. But it had happened, and it had happened here. Being here being, of course, uh, sorry, the it being first a reference to his noticing her, and then in the succeeding sentences, the vehicle for suggestions of something more physical and portentous. She remembers it now, not with her senses, as she has remembered it all week, but with her mind. It was a real thing. It had been, and here, last Saturday. What it turns out to be occurred upstairs in a little room beside the vestry, where Evelyn had left her gloves prior to the lesson. On returning to retrieve them, she found Mr. Willans alone, standing by a table and sorting out Sunday school papers. 
He was very tall, silent, and somehow liquid. The last, because he is a condenser for her romantic and religious ideals, part larger than life man and part sacred image. His eyes were deeper, quieter than any eyes she had ever seen, his lips full and delicately made and tender. He was not handsome. His face in profile was somewhat flat, almost convex, not handsome at all, but beautiful. A descendant of the highly imaginative and almost fatally romantic Anne of the early chapters of Anne of Green Gables, Evelyn projects what she later calls the love she has read about in stories onto Mr. Willans, but with a sexual emphasis alien to Montgomery's heroine. When he hands her her gloves, gloves being for obvious reasons a traditional and subsequently Freudian symbol of the female, she saw his hand touch them and observed that he touched everything with the suggestion of a caress, as if his fingers had some quick and magical sensitivity. But Mr. Williams is not the sensitive soul of Evelyn's romantic imaginings. Rather, he's an adept manipulator and sexual predator. When she enters the little room, he, is, he greeted her with an exclamation, Evelyn, gave her his undivided attention. He considered her with his head on one side and conveyed the impression that he has her best interests at heart. I was keeping your gloves to give to you in case you didn't remember, he says. Later, when he looks at her, his eyes catch hers and hold them, drawing them into depth and darkness and unreadable meaning, which she, na naive as she is, interprets as a secret love in the process of being revealed. Later still, he describes her as very thoughtful, always helpful, and very faithful. Well, feigned concern, shared knowledge, and extravagant flattery are core components of Satan's temptation of Eve in Paradise Lost, and they are no less central to Mr. Willens's seduction of Evelyn. Near the beginning of the seduction scene, an echo of Molly Bloom's famous soliloquy at the end of Ulysses can be heard in Evelyn's, yes, she had said breathlessly, feeling the blood beat into her face, yes. But in the scene as a whole, the loudest and most lasting echoes are the relationship that develops between Mabel Purvin and Dr. Ferguson in The Horse Dealer's Daughter. In both short stories, preliminary eye contact is followed by a sexual laying on of hands and eventually by a passionate kiss. But there's a crucial difference between the two. In The Horse Dealer's Daughter, there are inequalities of class and gender between Mabel and Dr. Ferguson, but they're both adults. In Story for Sunday, by contrast, Mr. Willens is in a position of power over Evelyn by virtue of his age and his role as Sunday school teacher, as well as by virtue of his gender. His seduction of her is thus trebly repugnant, no more jarringly so than, than when, after kissing her, he mutters, you dear child, you dear sweet child. I think more than the plot is thickening at this point. Uh, Evelyn's lofty adolescent view of love, however, dictates that she experiences his actions not as exploitative, but as evidence that the things of dreams and stories can come true. Since reality has obeyed the rules of romance, after Mr. Willens had left her in the room like a true romantic hero without looking back, Evelyn knew exactly how the future would unfold, uh, would unfold and how she should behave. One cliche of romance is followed by another. He would come and take her again and she must wait for him. The dark connotations of take her again are lost on Evelyn, but not on the reader. When the narrative returns to the present, the Sunday school service becomes an occasion for Evelyn to engage in erotic communion with the slender priest in a black robe who is the object of her desire. As he kneels at the lectern, Mr. Willens's compassionate musical voice flowers flows out in rhythmic phases. Even 
Evelyn shivers to hear him. He closes his eyes as he sings, and his voice can be heard over all the rest, passionate and clear. She moves in a clear, cold flame of love. It does not matter, she thinks, that she's only 15 and clumsy and homely, because it was not or an ordinary kind of love. This is the secret kind that has perhaps never been before, a kind no one else would believe or understand. Well, despite evidence to the contrary, Mr. Willans has not even looked at her this Sunday. When the class goes downstairs, she resolves to go and find him. Using an excuse to go upstairs to the little room off the vestry, the fiction that she has again left her gloves there. Almost needed to say, as she approaches the room, she hears her dialogue with Mr. Willans on the previous Sunday, replicated almost exactly with Myrtle, complete with a long sigh, the rustle of a silk dress, and a glimpse of their embrace. Disbelief is followed by acceptance, romantic fantasy by harsh reality. It was true he had kissed her last Sunday, and now he was kissing Myrtle. He would kiss others too, many others. It was all quite meaningless. There was no secret special love for her, no clear cold flame, nothing. But the flame is not extinguished. She loved him so much that she could have nothing else in her mind in her life. And when she returns downstairs, she finds herself with a hymn book in her hand, singing with the others. Mr. Willans had come down too, and his voice as he sang rang through her body like the fever pounding in her blood. She tried not to look at him, but even when her eyes held, her eyes held tight to the book, she could see only him, black-robed and beautiful. Then, as she sang fervently, Thou, O Christ, are all I want, more than all in thee I find, uh, the hymn is Charles Wells, uh, Wesley's uh, Jesus, Lover of My Soul, she has an epiphany, a burst of insight that begins in a moment, with a moment of self-recrimination. Now she understood. She had been wrong and stupid all the time. That recalls the boy's epiphany at the conclusion of Joyce's short story, Araby. But then she moves in a very different direction, ending with the pure light that is the center of a flame around the face of the Immaculate Christ. To Monroe's biographer, Robert Thacker, Evelyn's shift from adolescent rapture to religious fervor is forced and neat, but unlikely. Yet, I th would suggest it is not so much a shift as a folding of one into the other that entails both the transcendence and the preservation of the adolescent rapture. It is also a textbook example of two of the defense mechanisms that Anna Freud discusses, sublimation, which is to say the displacement of instinctual aims in conformity with higher social instincts, and the, intellectual, and the intellectualization of instinctual life, which is to say the attempt to hold back, to hold on to the uh, attempt to lay hold on the instinctual processes by connecting them with ideas which can be dealt with by the consciousness. She, and I'm quoting her now, the story, she had imagined that Mr. Willans could love her, only her, that he could make a circle around himself where only she could come. Now, she not only accepts that others must love him too, that no one could love, no one could be enough for him, but also sees him as a type of Christ. He is so much above them all, so large in soul and wisdom and spirit. His love surrounds every one whom he chooses, bears them all away until they are wholly lost in it. The thing that she has discovered was greater than a mean little private love, more strange and wonderful. Not until the final mention of the face of the Immaculate Christ is it clear that the he to whom Evelyn refers is other than Mr. Willans, as indeed he both is and he is not. She lifts her head as the music falls away and sees him, and it's lowercase him all the way rather than higher case him, as if she were seeing him for the first time. All the people in the room, the velvet curtains, the emblazoned text, blurred into a jumble 
and show a jumbled mosaic, and there is only his white, still face. In the jumbled mosaic of Evelyn's mind and perceptions, adolescent rapture jostles with religious fervor, puberty with adulthood. And now, just a, a brief conclusion. Viewed as an ensemble, the dimensions of a shadow, story for Sunday, and the widower, which alas, I had to ignore this evening, contain several elements and commonalities that resonate between and among them and anticipate Alice Munro's later work. None of these are more evident than the story's descriptions of the structures and patterns of urban space and the components and characteristics of domestic space. Houses, stores, and streets are described in all three sort short stories, sometimes with an accuracy suggestive of photography. On and behind the drawn green blinds of a shop in The Widower are bright stickers advertising Salada tea and Coca-Cola, pyramids of tin cans, and pyramids of oranges and apples. Later in the story, its protagonist notices, notices gravel walks laid out in a pattern in an urban park and recalls his younger self, how his younger self could see the clouds over the grimy city roofs and the crazy jumbled lines of the chimneys and alley fences of the town. In the long crooked street along which Evelyn walks in Story for Sunday, the locked and shuttered stores seem to her to have an odd look a queer air of stiffness and isolation, and to her eyes, the metal signs that flap in the wind are foolish things. Near the beginning of the dimensions of a shadow, Miss Abelhart notices that the sidewalk is divided into squares, and the squares make a block, small and tight, and the blocks make a tidy pattern, and imagines that the town is a pattern, hidden in the dark a pattern that, as she slips into madness, disappears, leaving only the empty, broken country, pathless in the dark. <laughs> to me, that's a powerful uh, pair of images of Canada, the, the city superimposed, or the town superimposed on what can suddenly become a wilderness. The interior spaces of the stories are almost invariably cluttered, shielded by lace curtains, and stuffy, musty, or mustily scented. Indeed, unpleasant and occasionally, occasionally pleasant smells appear in all three stories, as does Sunday, either as a day of anticipation or as a day of excursion. It is as if the church-dominated streets and rhythms and people of Joyce's Dublin have been transplanted, adapted, and given a local habitation, but not, note, a name. None of the urban areas in any of the short stories is identified and no mention is made of their geographical locations, though it is surely Ontario in the era of the Lord's Day Act. The three stories also have in common a multifaceted indebtedness to modern British literature, especially, as already seen at several points, to the short stories of Joyce and Lawrence. In addition to being epiphanic in their trajectories, all three are formalistically tight and graced by symbolic details and suggestive nuances, and all three focus centrally on the psychological interiors of their protagonists, each of whom is mentally disturbed and harbors thoughts that manifestly come from somewhere other than the conscious mind. The widower does not display the interest in human Freud that is glaringly apparent in the dimensions of shadow and the story of Sunday. But the development and themes of all three reflect the growing interest in Canada between and after the two world wars in such concepts as repression, sublimation, paranoia, infantile regression, and more generally, psychological mechanisms and structures. In sum, the three short stories of Alice Laidlaw reveal a writer in the process of finding the themes and absorbing the ideas that would emerge fully assimilated in the work of Alice Munro, the consummate physical and psychological realist of small town southwestern Ontario. A short story writer as adept at exploring the caves beneath the kitchen linoleum as of rendering the kitchen linoleum itself so vividly 
that we can see it in our mind's eye and are transported to what must surely be called Monroe Country. Thank you. Thank you very much.